And as Julie shared, she will be monitoring the chat box. So feel free to ask questions as they arise. Um, we are building in time to make sure that we have time to answer those questions. Let me share my presentation here. Okay. So today we're going to focus on reading red flags. Perhaps I should have said it literacy red flags because often we see students who are struggling readers are struggling with spelling um, and, and other areas kind of correlated with literacy. So we are going to talk through um, identifying those red flags, right? A lot of times as caregivers and kind of support teams for children, even if we don't need to be the experts necessarily in the intervention piece, but being able to recognize those red flags so that um, we can start the process of getting them support is, is something that's really important. And then we'll also focus on interventions. What do we do when we see a student struggling? So if we think about reading, um, I often, in my head, I guess, I picture it as a stool, like a three-legged stool. And of course, if anyone's ever had a, a stool or a chair that is um, wobbly and drives us nuts, right? It's something that needs to be fixed. We kind of have these, these three components that really need to be solid or strong um, to support the fluent acquisition of reading skills. And these are phonological awareness, orthographic processing, and kind of what we call RAN or rapid automatic naming. And we'll talk about those, um, those a little bit. These are things that certainly um, we expect to kind of come in uh, and be strong about by the time you're in third grade. That kind of gives you a sense of timeline, but there are stages at which they're, which they're developing. Um, and some of these are already developing before students even hit kind of their elementary school setting. So if we think about phonological awareness, essentially what that is, is it is without putting symbols or letters in front of a student. It's that ability to understand and work with um, sequences of sounds and understand how we can manipulate them, hold them apart, put them together to make language. And it is a continuum of skills that develop over time. So if we think about really early phonological awareness. And some of this we're working on, um, if you have children or you're a preschool educator, a lot of this you're doing as part of, you know, kind of daily activities you do with children, whether they're songs, things like that, right? That ability to identify words that rhyme is a very early phonological awareness skill, as is things like being able to match sounds, right? Things like um, you might um, here, you know, what is a, the sun starts with this sound, what is another, um, one, which one of these pictures also starts with this sound. So those are early skills. As students develop, we expect those phonological awareness skills, if nothing gets in the way, to continue to develop to where um, students can begin to think about individual sounds or phonemes within words. Um, and that as we move along kind of the continuum of more advanced phonological awareness, eventually the ability to kind of play around with sounds within words. So the ability to do things like, um, uh, if, we just, if I were to give you the word tiger, could you take away the g sound in tiger, what word would you have left? A student who has fluent phonological awareness would be able to identify that as tire. So that ability to kind of quickly hold that that word in their working memory, be able to delete, remove that sound, and then be able to understand what word is left. So that ability, um, having that fluent phonological awareness is essential to reading and spelling success. Orthography is the other important component. So essentially um, orthography um, or orthographic processing now we kind of introduce the symbols. So this is the, the ability to, um, in simple form, like the simplest understanding of it is the ability to understand that certain letter combinations make certain sounds. At a larger kind of, a larger piece of this is also understanding, um, having the ability to visually kind of support that certain letter strings, um, follow certain patterns so they can sp support spelling development. This is also largely what we rely on to recognize and 
um, our sight word acquisition because we are recognizing on a certain combination of letters that visual combination. We know that that word, that's what it looks like. Um, students who have strong orthographic processing skills also do not struggle with letter reversals because they're able to kind of visually um, understand um, how letters are formed, but also their directionality. Um, so that's another important piece. Um, and that's coming in obviously um, more around the time that we enter school because most students aren't spelling many words before they enter kindergarten. We wouldn't expect them to. The last area is rapid naming. It's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Rapid naming is the ability to um, see something and be able to quickly attach a verbal label, label to the symbol. So these are examples of actual rapid, 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 I can't talk today, rapid naming tasks that we can give students. Um, the reason there's a color one there, for example, is obviously as you're a younger child, you might not know all of your letters. So we can't see how quickly you name something you don't know. So we might have them name things like pictures um, and colors. And what we know is that rapid naming is highly correlated with reading fluency or, or reading rate. Um, as all, most of us, I'm guessing here are adults, um, who read pretty, who probably read pretty well. And what you'll realize is you probably notice that on a given day that you are not, right, sounding out every word you see. Um, you are kind of quickly going through what you're reading, recognizing whole units, um, and you're able to do that quickly because you are recognizing those stored pieces of information quickly. And that ability to read fluently and at a quick rate is due to you having average or better than average rapid naming ability. So those are the three processing areas that are really important. Um, and if they're all kind of average, age appropriate or better, um, we shouldn't really see too much difficulty in terms of literacy development, those reading and spelling skills. Of course, there sometimes can be, you know, some outlying reasons, right? If a, if a student hadn't, hasn't had school exposure, things like that. But for the most part, if those three um, are intact um, and we were able to look at all of those three skills early on, we could say, we don't have concerns for this child's development. Um, if we think about red flags, there are some that we can start seeing as young as pre-K. And I know we have a lot of TK now in most school districts. Um, and so that transitional kindergarten is working on the, those pre-K skills, but sometimes in a more systematic way with some more um, focused curriculum. So I think it's a, a great place that we've been able to start um, kind of tracking some of these skills and see some of these red flags. So at the earliest stages, um, difficulty remembering the letters of the alphabet can be a red flag. Um, difficulty recognizing rhyming words. And the reason we say recognizing is sometimes it's harder to produce things. That's a harder skill. But if they're not able to recognize or hear those sounds when you are offering those, especially if it's something that's being um, like the, the image we have there that's being supported with visual cues to reference, that difficulty being able to discern or recognize those, those rhyming words is, is a concern. In that same way, that sound matching um, can also be a concern. Um, also, difficulty recognizing letters. So a lot of times, um, you know, in pre-K or TK curriculum, there's a letter of the week where the student has had multiple exposures. They've been practicing, you know, writing it in sand or, um, you know, other different kind of multi-sensory ways to work with that letter. You've been singing it all week, singing it about it. And then we'll have a child that still maybe the next week doesn't recognize that that's the letter A, right? That would be a red flag in terms of they've had explicit exposure to, to that letter. And as we get to this age, not being able to recognize or write your own name could also be a red flag something to watch, something to monitor. As we move into first and second grade, um, there's, you know, there's a more formal literacy curriculum and more direct explicit instruction happening. Um, pretty much in any school district or school that you would be in, there is 
well, most have have a phonics instruction that is has you know um, some type of sequence and structure, and so a lot of these skills now are being explicitly taught. So when we see students are struggling with some foundational skills, it becomes a little bit more of a red flag that we can see because we know we know that they have had exposure to instruction, and so some of the red flags we see here are. Um, inconsistent letter recognition. So I see this with some students I work with that maybe sometimes they recognize that it's an M, but the next time they see it and it's left them um, might confuse some letters. Um, difficulty with sound symbol correspondence. So maybe they know it's an M, but they can't tell you all the time what the M, what sound that letter makes. Um, there's a lot of focus in early uh, elementary years on building your sight word vocabulary. And so for students who are really struggling for those kind of high frequency sight words to um, generalize, so they're seeing those sight words other places, not recognizing them, that's a red flag that could speak to that difficulty with orthographic um, pattern recognition and, and or visual memory. Um, letter or word reversals, letter reversals, um, it can be a red flag. They also sometimes can self-correct. We see letter reversals and it's considered developmentally appropriate until about the age of eight. However, I think anytime you see them in first or second grade, right, it is something that's a red flag. It would tell us like, let's monitor that. Let's look at that. Maybe if it's the only thing that's happening, we say like, well, let's work on that and see what happens. But certainly if you're seeing letter reversals in combination with a lot of these other difficulties, um, we might have some red flags. Um, I think when we see something more like word reversals or transpositions of letters and sounds, that's more of a red flag um, because what that is also telling us is the child is struggling to access that phonological awareness to be able to sound out the word they're trying to spell. So because they don't have that access, they're like, relying, kind of trying to picture what, how do you, how does that word look? And it's reversing, right? So it's, it's not a, um, a phonetic spelling, if you will. And then of course, we start to see pretty early on that we, some other big red flags are how kids are starting to feel about themselves and their confidence. So I always say a red flag from a very younger, young age, especially because I'm, I work with so many gifted, right? individuals who have struggled to read is someone avoiding reading or saying it's too hard or getting upset because it's time to read who otherwise likes being at school, likes stories, likes when you read to them. Um, to me, that's a kind of qualitative red flag that sometimes I don't know if it gets enough attention because something is going on that is making that a, a not a pleasurable experience for that child. The other piece just here I have a note is you know, one of the best indicators we have, obviously, is to look at someone's spelling and look at their written work, um, because it's very uncommon that, um, you know, you're getting a lot of chances to hear the child read unless you are their, their first or second grade teacher who's doing a running record. So a lot of times where we're able to see the red flags as other people in the child's life, whether it's you know, a tutor or a parent, you know, sibling, anything like that is when we see their written work and we're, we're seeing some of those challenges. As we get older um, and, you know, the, the biggest challenge is largely once we get into third grade, the assumption is that you're reading. And so for students who aren't, they're kind of left behind because that explicit instruction, unless you've been identified as needing special help, um, has pretty much is no longer the focus. So you're not learning to read anymore, you're reading to learn. And we see that gap become more pronounced, which is why we are hoping um, so much to identify red flags before third grade, kind of a mission I have. Um, but what we see in other red flags is we, and I hear a lot of parents say they've seen this when they read with their child, is they're seeing a lot of guessing for lack of a better term. So the child's reading out loud, they're seeing the word looks like this. So they might see the first two letters of the word in the last letter. And so you see a lot of um, visual substitutions of words, um, which of course is problematic because not only does that 
you know, make reading disfluent, but it also can skew your comprehension of what you're reading if you're making a lot of substitutions. Another red flag is just labored or inefficient decoding. If a student has to stop every time they come to a word they don't know, and if it's a, something that happens often, and really use, really think through what each letter sound makes, right? Even if it's successful, if it takes a long time, they have now, their reading rate and their fluency has been so disrupted that they often lost what they've already read. They have to go back and reread sentences, things like that. Other red flags, um, just a slow reading rate. Um, I think poor spelling um, at this age is problematic. Um, when we think about not everyone has to win the spelling bee, but again, it's those non-phonetic misspellings where you're like, I don't know what that word is, or you really need context to understand what they're, they're writing. Um, this is where we, when we start, you know, third grade and beyond, it does become a problem if you start seeing letter reversals or confusion of the ball and stick letters, B, D, P, and Q, those are the most commonly reversed, but we also see kids who will confuse M and W based on the directionality of that letter. Those are a huge red flag as you've gotten to this age, because if they haven't um, corrected, it's something that's going to need some intervention to help on. Um, another piece of things is um, a lot of kids who, let's say, have dyslexia um, have difficulty kind of um, because of that rapid naming and retrieval challenge that often goes hand in hand, that processing deficit. You'll also see some challenges sometimes in other areas that rely heavily on that retrieval. So they might have difficulty remembering math facts. So a lot of parents start seeing it um, when they're just having a really hard time learning multiplication facts. Um, they know the facts, but they can't do a timed math facts test. Um, they might have difficulty remembering dates, names, things like that. And if they're in a school, that maybe is an immersion program or has bilingual instruction or even taking a second language, they're struggling there. Which if you think about it, it makes sense. If you're having struggle, if you're struggling to kind of acquire foundational language skills in one language, um, especially if it's phonetic, then it's going to make sense that if you're in a, if you're taking Spanish or Italian, another language that's phonetic and Latin based, you're also gonna have similar challenges. And so we often see, that's a red flag parents will see like, oh, they're struggling um, in their immersion program in both languages. Um, so when we think about a student that's struggling, and this is interesting, I was, I was sharing with Julie as we, were, as we were talking today, there recently, and I don't know if everyone's aware, um, there is a bill that's in process now um, in California to make um, for universal screening for dyslexia. It's been a long fight to get that going. Um, it's kind of incredible because 40 states already require that you do this and somehow California has not been on board. Um, and the idea behind this bill that's being passed is that it would make for universal screening for dyslexia in that kindergarten to second grade year. And it has a lot of kind of um, uh, kind of specific things written out about what is being assessed at every one of those ages. Um, and a lot of it is what we kind of were just talking about in this presentation earlier about what are those kind of core competencies um, in those processing areas that should be there. Um, and if they're not, what do we do about that? And that is what we've needed because the idea is if you've struggled with the instruction, that has been given to you in your school and given to everyone else. And it hasn't been enough to make, uh, for you to make progress and to be meeting grade level standard in reading and spelling. We need to do something. There needs to be some intervention. Something needs to happen differently for that child. But without this universal screening, we're seeing more and more children, especially bright ones who compensate well, who haven't been identified as needing intervention to much later on in their academic career. So the hope with bills like this and universal screening is we will catch these things early on and put these children into what is called res response to intervention, or in some districts is called MTSS, multi-tiered support services, multi-tiered leveled support services, 
essentially it's basically identifying um, that they need targeted teaching to reach grade level standards. <clears throat> and these um, support systems can be used for a student who's struggling in any area, just like if you needed um, speech support or social emotional support, you could go through this tiered system. Um, but we're seeing it, especially at the elementary level, um, be used. Most tier service, tiered services are being used for students who are struggling academically. Um, and the importance of, of this and whether, you know, a child is participating is that we want to make sure that there is progress monitoring as they are participating in these services. Because the idea is that at each tier, we're looking at and monitoring progress to, you know, discuss if they are improving at an expected rate or do they need additional or different support. Um, so this is what should be happening at schools sometimes for parents. And I see different things at different schools and different districts. The access and how you get to these things isn't often, it's not often posted or made widely available. Um, but uh, my hope is with more of these forced <laughs> screenings, then we'll see children, um, especially those that don't have parents that are able to advocate or, or know, know about these things, um, who are kind of this way identified and put into that uh, tier two level where they need targeted intervention. So a question often when, you're, when there's reading troubles is, is it dyslexia? Um, on top of this, this new bill that's coming out, it took an incredible fight, even though dyslexia is the most widely researched and well-known um, neurodevelopmental disorder, if you will. Um, it took an incredibly long time to get <laughs> dyslexia even um, identified or, or the willingness for it to be said in public schools. It took a long time and some, a lot of advocacy to get to a point where it could be written in and mentioned into IEPs. Um, so it's not, hasn't even been that many years that we could get um, that language in there. Um, dyslexia is a language-based learning disability. And essentially it, it is a term that is related to a cluster of symptoms that result in people having difficulty with um, the academic skills that are related to language. So reading, spelling, writing, sometimes for some people into things like pronouncing words. The reason we should care so much and why there should be universal screening is it's not a rare disability. Um, most recent um, studies believe that about 20% of the population have dyslexia. Um, so when we kind of encounter educators or different institutions where people don't have a working knowledge of, of dyslexia, given how high um, the student, you know, the number of people impacted by it are, it's, it's concerning and it's, it's something that we wanna make sure um, that we, we talk about and we help people identify. Ashley, can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Um, somebody asked if yeah. they can get a copy of the presentation. Absolutely. Okay. Send that out. Definitely. So we won't go into the, to the science. I could talk about dyslexia all the time because I find it fascinating, but <laughs> as you can probably tell, but the reason I show this slide is I just, it's really important to me um, that people, you know, understand there are so many studies that have been done. There's so much neuroscience support and understanding that there is a difference between how a dyslexic and a non-dyslexic brain function. And so I like this graphic just showing um, that there is that difference. And it makes sense if that brain is functioning differently, why we would have to do something differently to help activate those parts of the brain that are not being activated. Um, and so what you can actually see is that there are three dominant areas of the brain that, that are usually activated for reading, but in those with dyslexia, only one area of the brain is being stimulated. Um, and so Again, this is something that is well researched and that we know there, you know, most of the large research institutions continue to do brain imaging. It's a large part of what UCSF Dyslexia Project does to continue these studies and look at how the brain functions. But we know that, you know, it is something that um, exists due to kind of our wiring. So 
the big thing with red flags, right, is we we trust our gut. We say something something's going on. It's really up to the parent or caregiver, educational rights holder of the child, to decide what they want to do with those red flags. You can certainly go through that tiered system, kind of as we we talked about. If the school's saying, well, they're struggling a little bit, they're lagging in reading, we would like them to just see, um, you know, the general education. We have a reading class twice a week. Let's try that and see how they do. That's fine. Um, but the other thing that is your right um, as, a, as a parent or caregiver is if you're seeing these red flags, you are pretty sure something's going on. You have a right to request an assessment for special education elig eligibility through the school district. You also could choose to do a private neuropsychological assessment um, to look at, at, at dyslexia. So in terms of assessment, those are the kind of two paths you can go. Technically, there's a third path where you could go through the medical model. They're just not known for doing robust evaluations really related to um, learning. Often that's more a route to go for something like ADHD or a developmental disorder. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a benefit to both. Obviously a district assessment, there's no cost involved. Um, but a lot of parents choose to also go through a private assessment because um, you do have a clinical psychologist looking at the child um, and so that there actually can be a DSM-5 diagnosis given through that assessment. Um, but I think with a little bit of, um, you know, with a little bit of knowledge in, in terms of what the parent knows what to ask for, I think you can get a great assessment either way, if you know kind of the language. So either way, if you suspect your child has dyslexia or you're really concerned about the reading and spelling, you would just want to make sure that that assessment is asking for looking at all of those processing areas we talked about that are impacted in dyslexic learners. So you wanna make sure that assessment looks at phonological and orthographic processing. And if you request certain areas are looked at, it doesn't mean they have to do certain tests, but the district does need to assess in all areas that you have concern in. So that would help direct that assessment. Um, so dyslexia, is kind of an educator term. We know what it means. It's well-researched, but in the DSM-5, so that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that we use, um, students who have dyslexia um, often receive a diagnosis called a specific learning disorder. Just like if they have an IEP and they're found eligible, it's usually under specific learning disability. So although that we know what dyslexia is, is the term those of us that are involved in identification and intervention use, we use. Um, it's an alternative term. And so what you'll see often is that children who have dyslexia receive a diagnosis of a specific learning disorder. And then it will um, basically further delineate or detail what areas are impaired as a result of that. And so you, so you often will see kiddos, especially younger kiddos with dyslexia, who actually end up with two diagnoses because both their reading and their written language are impacted. And so they'll receive a specific learning diagnosis in both of those areas. Um, and so that's just kind of something to know if you, if you go through you know, a clinical model, um, the dyslexia, you'll receive that DSM-5 diagnosis. Something that's important to know um, is in terms of special education eligibility in 504 plans. So sometimes people get, you know, a, um, a private assessment. They're very, it's very obvious their child has dyslexia. They're diagnosed with that. Um, and so they take that to the school district and they say, we want an IEP. It's important to know that a diagnosis alone does not qualify someone for um, special education or for an IE, IEP plan um, because special education is designed for children with a disability that basically creates a barrier to them being able to access their education without specialized supports. Um, so they don't have to meet their potential. They don't have to excel. 
a school district does not have to enrich, but so if they are able to access the curriculum without needing change to how they do school, they wouldn't qualify. However, many do, um, and the way they qualify is under that specific learning disability category. And what the district looks for to see if they qualify is, is there a discrepancy between their intellectual profile, so their IQ, their cognitive skills, their reasoning skills, um, and where they currently are achieving academically. Uh, and they look at that academic achievement by school-based assessments and also formalized assessments done as part of, part of the assessment process. And is that discrepancy related to a processing challenge? Is it because they don't have good phonological processing skills? Is there a visual processing um, issue? Do, is there attentional processing? So that's how you qualify there. A large percentage of dyslexic learners are also supported by 504 plans rather than IEP plans. Um, and that also has an eligibility process that um, threshold, if you will, is not as significant because what a 504 plan looks at, um, it's a general education support plan. It um, basically provides accommodations. Um, so it looks at the fact that the individual needs um, accommodations to the learning environment to be able to uh, access their education. And so that is also a way that a number of dyslexic learners are supported in the classroom because the 504 plan will allow for things like them having extended time on exams or um, not being penalized for spelling when they're working by hand, having access to a computer at all times, some of those types of things. Typically, and this is not, but a lot of times people say like, what's the, what's the difference? What should I want for my child? It's not always as clean as this, but the way that it helps people to think about is if you feel that your child needs services, then you want to go for an IEP plan because for the most part, services are only given through an IEP. Technically through a 504 plan, they can still give you services, but it doesn't have the legal teeth to where you your, your child would have to get those services for a set amount of time at those given minutes and they can't be taken away unless the IEP team describes it. So that's sometimes how it helps people think about like, well, what, what process do I think my child needs? Um, what process would I want to go through? What's important is either way, you know, and then there's some parents that are like, we're just going to support the child outside of school. What do they need? We found out they're dyslexic. What, what does that instruction look like? What we know, the good thing about dyslexia being so well-researched and us knowing about it for so long is that we also know what to do with it and how to support, support children who have dyslexia. And so what they need is for us to approach their literacy instruction differently, right? And a lot of the frustration comes from so many years of sometimes people just repeating things the same way to them and expecting the outcome to be different. And so what we know is that um, they need multi-sensory structured language intervention. Um, and examples of such programs, if anyone's heard of these, are things like Slingerland, Orton-Gillingham, Wilson Reading Program. Um, the difference in these is that they simultaneously use the three kind of learning pathways. So they're teaching visual, auditory, and kinesthetic at the same time making sure that the students are getting that multi-sensory component. Um, and it is very explicit instruction that is direct and cumulative. So every skill builds on each other in a developmentally appropriate way. And these programs have a very clear scope and sequence until you master this component. We do not leave you in the dust as we move on to this next component, right? So there's that sequence that's very clear that builds, builds on one another. Um, and these programs also touch on all of the areas um, within their lessons that are impacted by dyslexia. That phonemic awareness, the orthographic piece, they look at the structural analysis of language, spelling, and build reading fluency. So all of those components are addressed by these programs. Um, and what we do know 
is really for students to make progress is these programs have to be administered with fidelity um, and have a frequency of duration that allows for progress. And so typically what we see, and of course there's different severity levels of impairment, um, is that students need at least two to three hours a week of this instruction. Um, this is just a visual or like graphic of, um, so people ask why Orton Gillingham, and that's the research-based um, intervention program that that we know works. Um, Orton Gillingham is also kind of this umbrella term of it has all of these components. So on the right, I just kind of listed um, some programs you'll hear in districts use that are Orton Gillingham based, or at least Orton Gillingham influenced. Sometimes it's helpful for parents or educators just to know you know, know like, well, what are some that if I hear my districts using this, can I feel good about this? Do, can I feel, you know, um, assured that these are research-based so that if they are offering it to my child, I feel like this is a good use of their pull out of the classroom, right? So those are kind of listing, listed there. Um, the Sunday system, particularly, we're seeing a lot of districts um, um, acquire as their um, Orton-Gillingham-based intervention. And um, it's working well for a, a lot of learners in school districts. So I'm seeing that one be pretty popular. Um, this is just a list of some, you know, common accommodations that we see for students um, who have dyslexia, especially as they get kind of further along in their elementary career. Um, extended time, that makes sense, right? If your reading is effortful and it takes longer, <laughs> That's going to make you need, you know, that's going to require extended time for a lot of things that you do. Um, sometimes we have students who need access to a reader. Something that's often overlooked is um, the impact it has on other areas. So there might be a student who's very good at math, but we don't always think about the fact that math, especially the way we teach it now, is very language heavy. And so sometimes we need to make sure that students are um, for math assessments or math activities that someone is actually reading the text to them um, to make sure that they are able to do the activity. Um, the other thing that can be helpful just because things take longer is to adjust assignments. So we see a lot of students who um, have dyslexia um, or other processing challenges are very well served by adjusting the assignment load to focus on content or the quality of the work rather than the quantity. So they might only do the even math problems or instead of writing 20 sentences with the vocab words, they're gonna choose 10 to do because we know that it's gonna take them the same amount of time as a peer who does not have that challenge. And they're still meeting that learning objective. We haven't changed the curriculum or modified um, our expectation of their mastery. We've just changed the amount of work to compensate for that time. The other thing that can be, a couple other things that can be helpful is, um, you know, when you're young is access to a scribe. The worst thing we want to do is have a child that feels like they can't um, participate in writer's workshop because they can't write, right? So having that option to, you know, dictate to a parent or um, a teacher's assistant. And as you get older, we live in a time that has some great um, technology um, supports for things like dictation, which can be helpful. Um, we also, there's a lot, it's very helpful to have access to e-format or text-to-speech programs, especially for more daunting or larger um, texts as students get older. Um, for novels, textbooks, um, being able to have those read to them can make a difference, especially because um, when the academic vocabulary is so dense, to have to pause to decode all the time really gets in their way of being able to attack the text. Um, and just having access to a calculator all the time for math, because we do see that difficulty with the quick retrieval of math facts get in the way as they get older with them being able to do more complex math tasks. Um, I'm going to do a whole nother talk about assistive technology. <laughs> There's a lot out there. Um, but just, I just have some things here just, you know, as a resource. And like we said, we, you know, we can share um, these slides. There's just great assistive technology for struggling readers. Um, one of the best things is a membership to Learning Ally and Bookshare. Those are e-text memberships so that 
Um, they can have their novels and textbooks, even um, encyclopedia, if they're doing research read to them, it also remains in front of them as they read. So that really helps to support um, acquisition of new sight words because they're able to see and their brain will recognize um, new words as they see them, but also help remove kind of the burden of slow fluency um, and substitution errors. Those won't be happening. And there are also all kinds of um, more comprehensive text-to-speech programs where you can click on words as you're reading and it'll read it to you, tell you what the word means, um, and it can basically read anything aloud So as you're working. So lots of assistive technology out there. Um, and a lot of questions I get, and the nice thing about being here so long and getting to test um, a lot of youth kind of throughout their, their lifetime. Um, I get to see them after intervention. So there, I've actually had some families where I've tested the child three times. It's incredible to get to see the growth. I always get the question of like, well, what does it look like later? So this is forever. Um, and so what we know about dyslexia over time, um, is what we see with successful intervention is that decoding and word recognition improves. And so because of that, access isn't as much of an issue. But what does continue is typically their reading rate or their reading speed remains slow. And so what is helpful at that point is we still always consider that a success because at that point, these assistive tech, these technology tools, you know, can compensate, right? If you're, if it's, if it's solely a speed issue, um, I've worked with a lot of brilliant dyslexic young people who are going to the best colleges and grad schools all over the country. Um, and they'll tell you the single difference is that I use Learning Ally and I have everything read to me and now I don't get slowed down, right? And so, um, so that's kind of what we see. Sometimes spelling remains an area of weakness, but again, um, you know, if you can get to a point where your spelling is phonetic enough for spell check to pick it up, um, that's all we need to be successful. And we do see that a lot of dyslexic students just continue to need basic testing accommodations through college and graduate school um, because school is the only time in to be to be blunt that we have these artificial right conditions of like you need to do this within one hour, right? A lot of these things would not impact you in the workplace when people are only interested in the final product. And I just have a list of a few resources here um, that I think are helpful. LD Online is just a great um, resource of just like one pagers about a variety of different topics. I put Decoding Dyslexia here. I do a lot of work with that organization. Um, it's a grassroots organization. It's interesting. It has kind of three components. One is a legislative. So they're very involved in passing these universal screening bills, but they also have fantastic parent education components, um, parent support groups by region. Um, so it's just an interesting organization to be aware of. Um, I just have a single book here, Overcoming Dyslexia by Shewitz is probably the most kind of well-known book about dyslexia. It's a good one. So it continues to kind of be the most read. Um, and I don't know how many people know about Parents Helping Parents. It's a good resource for you beyond dyslexia about any thing related to learning or development, but they have an amazing e-learning library that's free um, that has archive webinars, training, supports. And so if you are interested in assistive technology that I briefly touched on, um, they have an assistive technology department. So they are gurus in that area and even have technology kits that you can um, check out and borrow and play around with and things like that. So a great resource. And I did another talk for a school system and someone had asked like, how do I know what reading level my child should be or what books I should get them? And so I just have a link here that just, um, just has a chart based on Lexile level and how you can choose books for your child um, so that you can find high interest materials that depending on um, where they are level-wise. Hopefully you can find books that keep them still wanting to read, even if they're struggling. 
So that was a lot of information and I'm happy to share the slides, but I know we probably have some questions, Julie. Yeah, there are a lot of questions in the chat. I didn't want to interrupt. Let's see, um, should we just take them in order? Um, sure. Somebody was asking about letter reversals, but somebody happily uh, kind of supplied an answer. It's kind of mixing the B with the D and the P with the Q. Mm -hmm. Those are the most common. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, what can be done already in TK to help children with these red flags? Yeah. I think, um, and if, you know, I think the good thing about that age is so many of these things can be worked on in a game-based form. So you can even through, you know, um, you could go on Amazon, you can buy like rhyming games, um, things like that. Um, with letter formations and things like that, a lot of kids actually like these activities. Um, you can do you know, on a mirror or even a baking sheet with shaving cream or sand, you can work with them on doing, on forming their letters. Um, the other thing that's really fun that kids like that I've worked on, kids love whiteboard markers. They also set, um, sell um, erasable window markers. Um, so allowing them to practice their letters for some reason, if it's not a worksheet, it's exciting. Right. <laughs> Just kind of those um, multi-sensory pieces. And if you think about multi-sensory, um, you know, if you're working on like the letter B, it's reinforcing that we're making the B as we're saying the letter B and what sound does it make? So those types of things, um, because at that age, a lot of times they just need, they might need, um, more repetition of something that is only covered briefly at school. Okay, let's see. The next one was how early can schools identify or assess dyslexia? And what's the process to request uh, dyslexia assessment yeah. with the school? So you're going to hear different things from school districts. Sometimes they will say things like, we want the child to be two years behind. And then you're like, but I have a first grader. How's that possible? Um, so you know, we have measures um, like um, the comprehensive test of phonological processing goes down to the age of four. So I think in terms of um, uh, if this universal screening starts going, the idea is, is that we wouldn't need a full um, assessment to start intervening. But I think you can safely say often I say first or second grade. The reason is, is that in terms of special education eligibility, I think even if the red flags are there and in a private assessment, you ended up with a diagnosis, the school's answer is going to be that there hasn't been enough, they haven't had enough time in school. Um, and anytime there's a question about limited exposure to a skill, that essentially would make you not eligible um, for special education. If we think about, we do such a good job now in kindergarten of teaching literacy very explicitly that if you are really behind in first grade, that you know we would we would consider it a deficit. So that was a long way about saying I think first grade is a good time to assess if you're concerned. I think for those of us that know dyslexia, and I've had some families I've worked with that it runs in the family, they're like, we just want to nip it in the bud. Um, we don't care if it's diagnostic, but we would like to look at these markers and get intervention. I think we can tell in kindergarten. Okay. Somebody was asking about tools within classrooms to teach dyslexic students. Mm -hmm. And they put a K. I don't know if they're talking about kindergarten. Okay. But yeah. So I think what you're seeing is in a lot of elementary classrooms, um, they, what they can do is, you know, and that's that tier one level of support is that they're working with kids in small groups and the kids sometimes are grouped based on where their acquisition of skills are. You have leveled reading groups and things like that. Um, most schools have a general education reading specialist um, that kids can see if they're falling behind. And so I think sometimes how you get to that person is a little unclear. And so some of that is just advocating for your child about, I'm concerned, can my child be screened? And how do we get to that reading specialist? Um, asking those questions because every site um, 
you know, does that a little bit differently. We are seeing a lot of schools use computer-based programs as the answer um, as well. So they're doing like iReady or some of these Lexia programs where the kids that are falling behind are doing um, computer-based practice to work on those skills. Um, and those programs all have printout components for parents so they can see where they are in the program and their progress. Um, but I think unfortunately, or fortunately, because it depends where you are, um, we see such different supports for both the teachers and for the kids, depending on every school site, what's available. And so it's not uniform. Um, and, you know, I think from, you know, I, I think all teachers would like more support because they're doing a fantastic job they can with the curriculum, but with all those little kindergartners, it's hard to, you know, be at everyone's individual level. Um, but some of it, I think you just have to talk to your school site about what they have. Okay. Um, and when you were going over the red flags, you were at the third grade red flags and somebody's asking, if they're seeing that those red flags in their first and second grader, is that normal and expected? Yeah, I mean, you, I think it's something to watch, but it's not a first grader or a second grader as they decode unfamiliar words. It's going to be laborious because that's they're working on that skill. Um, but you know, if you see a third grader that really has to like stop and be like, is that a long or short vowel? A sound, that's a different concern. Um, as we move into third grade, it's it's really that um, that reading should really be moving towards fluency and that automaticity. Um, that was a good question. Okay. And then somebody had an interesting question about um, uh, logographic language systems. So pictographical writing systems. They're wondering if dyslexia still shows up in countries that use, um, have different language, um, you know, written languages. I got you. That use, yeah. So like if you use more of a symbolic rather than a phonetic, um, I'm not as well versed in like their identification and, you know, the same number, you know, in terms of do we still see 20% um, or not? Um, I think, you know, there's, especially because there's different presentations of dyslexia, which would be a whole nother talk. Um, I think, you know, when they're not phonetically based, you're not going to see those languages. So you're not going to see if phonological processing deficits get in the way. But certainly if you're struggling with that orthographic or visual representation piece, that's still going to impact, right, acquisition of language in that piece. Um, so what we do see, right, for a lot of kids who have more like moderate to severe dyslexia who really struggle with that language, what they'll often do to meet their foreign language requirement is take American Sign Language, right? Mm -hmm. Which is relying so heavily on the visual and the kinesthetic piece because it's a movement-based um, piece versus a phonetic. And that's how they are often successful learning a foreign language. Oh, cool. Um, there's a few questions about how to request a district diagnostic. And somebody did actually um, put in the chat a sample letter that you can send to the school's principal. I don't right. know if you would, um, from the parent center hub. Yeah, um, no, that's great. I think something to know is um, it's not a quick process. So you request an assessment. Um, you can do it to the principal. Sometimes things get lost at the, at the school site level. So we that are kind of special education advocates or lawyers, right, would, would often say, send it to the district office or the special ed department. Um, so anyway, you request the assessment. They have 15 calendar days to respond to you with what's called an assessment plan, which is a one page document that has a bunch of little boxes that say, these are the areas we're gonna assess your child. And you have to sign and return that because you have to give them permission to assess your child. Once they receive that assessment plan, they have 60 calendar days to complete all of the assessments and hold that IEP meeting where they discuss the results with you and you work together to draft that plan. So that's why I mean, if you're concerned, you know, it does, it's not a fast process because in the best of times, you're at least, you know, two to three months out. Um, and those timelines remain true, except when summer vacation gets involved. So let's say we requested it now, 
we're almost in May, we don't have the 60 days, um, I would say still do it. What essentially will happen is they'll have to complete the assessment and hold the meeting in the first 30 days of the fall. But they can't, you know, they don't work in the summer. So they won't right. <laughs> they take that break. Um, so that'll just be, so when they basically, when districts come back to school, right, in the fall, they have a bunch of assessments they have to do because any that kind of fell over into falling in the summer, they have that first 30 days to wrap up. Somebody was asking about the multi-sensory structured literacy instruction. They're wondering, does it work online as well as it does in person? You know, there's so many of us during the pandemic, myself included, that started doing it online and we asked that same question. Um, I would say a lot of it is dependent on the child. It does because there are a lot of ways to use, like we use the Slingerland paper, for example, you can, uh, you know, we use the whiteboard function on Zoom. I would say my belief comes down to the child's ability to attend. I have found that children who have coexisting attentional problems, um, Zoom instruction is not their friend. And I think a lot of parents might, <laughs> you know, would agree just from seeing school happen at home. So it's not always successful. Um, so for a lot of children in person is better, especially for little ones. But there are a lot of older students who don't have attentional problems that have thrived working with like even at our our office fully remote and continue to, they've been successful. So I think it's really dependent on the child um, and what they need. Okay, well, it looks like we've reached one o'clock. There's a few more questions, but I think people need to get back to work. Thank you so much, Ashley. This was awesome. I see a lot of positive uh, comments in the chat and um, it's it's been so helpful for all of us to learn about this. Sure, and please, I, I sent you my slides, Julie, so you can share them with whoever. And the only thing I wanted to say is, um, that Morrissey Compton is always a resource. Um, something that, uh, another reason that I love working here so much is we are a non-for-profit and so we will help um, with assessment, advocacy, intervention, um, all families regardless of their financial situation. So if we can ever be a support in any way, we are here. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.